Hi guys, it's March 17, 2022, and it's been three weeks of Russian invasion of Ukraine. The initial plan of making Ukraine surrender within 48 hours failed, and there seems to be no plan B. The whole invasion slowed down. Today, let's try to summarize what's going on and how the situation may develop in the upcoming weeks. Here is the current map of the approximate situation in Ukraine, with the red are recent Russian gain and the blue are Crimea and Donbas separatists. The situation is not that bad, considering that you are fighting against the so-called second army in the world. And the most of the Russian gains happened within the first week, and not much happened recently. Let's look a bit closer on the specific areas of the conflict. The Russian primary goals were three largest cities of Ukraine, which are Kiev, Kharkiv and Odessa. None of them are even close of being captured or circled. In Kiev, a city with 3 million population, Russia captured the northern area above the capital in the first couple of days of invasion, and currently has the largest concentration of troops in that area. It might look like a big chunk of land, but it's basically a Chernobyl exclusion zone where nobody lives and also a bunch of villages. The major fights are happening in Kiev suburbs of Gostomel, Bucha and Irpen, bringing extreme destruction to these towns. Irpen was captured back and forth by Russian troops, but now it's fully back under Ukrainian control. The principal highway of E-40 is occupied as well, and there were several attempts to go down, but all of them failed. Particularly the town of Makaro is back again under Ukrainian control, despite some maps online are still making it as Russian. Basically, Russian forces tried really hard to circle east of Kyiv for the last two weeks, with absolutely zero success. Every day there are rumors that a large assault on Kyiv is about to happen, and that Russian units take some time to reorganize themselves, but nothing really happens. There are also some troops east of the city, but their number is much smaller. They tried to advance during the first week, but all of them pushed back. The war experts I've read fully agreed that you need to have at least three times more of the troops to be able to capture Kyiv. Two days ago, Prime Ministers of Poland, Czechia and Slovenia took a train from Poland all the way to Kyiv to meet Zelensky. I'm not sure they actually took the train, but it's quite a symbolic trip, showing that Ukraine is not alone against Russia and Kyiv is well protected and basically ready for tourist season. Very important note, all these Prime Ministers are conservative and from so-called New Europe. Unfortunately, the only real thing leftist Macron can do is dress up like Zelensky, and I'm not even talking about German communist Scholz. What is odd that it was Slovenian prime minister, not Slovak. Slovakia has a border with Ukraine, and it kind of makes perfect sense to actively support neighboring Ukraine, but Slovenia is far away small mountain country in Balkans, uh, which has never had any important place in international politics, with an exception of Melania Trump, who is originally from there. But apparently the prime minister of Slovenia is the local Donald Trump, at least according to Wikipedia. Another member of the trip is Jaroslav Kaczynski, deputy PM of Poland. In 2008, during the Georgian-Russian war, his twin brother Lech Kaczynski, who was a president of Poland back then, organized a similar trip to support Georgian struggle against Russian invasion. The war was practically over right after that visit back then, although I'm not sure these things are related. However, later in 2010, Lech Kaczynski died in a plane crash while landing in Smolensk, Russia. And there is a conspiracy theory with some sane argument that Putin was involved in that. And it was actually a murder. Let's move on. Next city, Kharkiv, with 1.4 million of population. The second largest group of Russian troops are concentrated in the north. During the first week, they tried really hard to take the city and at some point it looked like the situation was quite critical. But for the last two weeks, the situation with land offense is under control and there is no immediate danger of land invasion. You can enter and exit Kharkiv as famous Ukrainian singer Slava Vakarchuk did yesterday. Because the Russians couldn't invade the city, they decided to brutally and heavily bombard it during the last two weeks, including the historical center and the normal people's houses. Ironically, Kharkiv is the most Russian-speaking city in Ukraine, which fully undermines Putin's propaganda about denazification. Now, 100% of Russian speakers are strongly against Putin and Russia, despite the initial expectation that Kharkiv will be saluting and welcoming the Russian army. The whole conflict between Russia and Ukraine resembles one between South and North Korea, 
it's not about the language, but about freedom and democracy versus Putinism and totalitarian state. Next, let's look at two northern cities, Chernigiv, 280,000 people, and Sumy, 250,000. They are semi-circled by Russians from the first days of war, but nothing is going on for the last two weeks with an exception of a slight advance in Chernigiv. The Russian could have potentially taken them, but clearly decided not to do so and save their troops for capturing Kiev and Kharkiv. In Donbas, the situation is a bit worse. Before the war started, the Ukrainian army was expecting a major military offense coming from these breakaway regions, and the army made an enormous fortification along the border with separatists. And for the first week, there were zero advancements through these areas. But then the Russian forces from the southeast came and broke the defense around the city of Volnovakha and pretty much leveled the whole town to the ground. The most critical situation right now is in Mariupol, a large city of 430,000 of population. It is fully circled and under siege with a huge Russian army present and constant bombardments and extreme civilian loss. Russia destroys everything. The maternity hospital, the theater where people were hiding from shelling, extremely cruel and against all the rules of war. The city is protected by Azov Battalion, which is the most Nazi one according to Putin, and the goal is to level to the ground the whole city as a revenge. The good thing is that not the best Russian forces are concentrated around Mariupol. There are a bunch of separatist farmers who were forced to join the army without much desire and experience, and they are basically a cannon fodder. My guess is that Mariupol can survive under siege for several weeks or even months. North of Donetsk, Ukrainian army still has strong fortification and currently the largest battles are happening there. The region directly up north from Lugansk is marked as red on the map, but these are a bunch of villages, so it's not really important at that point. The war situation is in the south. Two cities of significant size were captured by Russians. It's Kherson of 285,000 and Melitopol 150,000. These were all done during the first week. And the main reason of that was the failure of the Ukrainian army to provide arms to the civilians and to move a significant amount of the troops. No one expected an attack from all directions and the south of Ukraine was not properly protected. If only they could have blown the bridge going to Kherson on day one, the situation would have been much different. Nonetheless, the citizens of both cities are going on rally against occupation pretty much every day, which is not how it was back in 2014 in Donbas region. There were rumors about the upcoming referendum for the independent Kherson's People Republic, but it's quite unlikely, politically speaking. It's really not 2014. No one wants to join North Korea. Another very important city is Mykolaiv, 490,000, with a very cool leader, Vitaly Kim, who is an ethnic Korean. Here the story is completely different. After three weeks of offense and shelling, the Russian army couldn't advance much. And capturing this city is crucial to establish the way to Odessa. And speaking about Odessa with a population of 1 million, there were rumors that Russian seaborne troops were about to land there pretty much since the beginning of invasion, but nothing happens. To do this for real, they need a strong support from the land, which is problematic because Mykolaiv holds the crucial bridge. There is another one in the north, in the city of Voznesensk, and Russian forces tried to advance there and capture that city as well, but lost and had to retreat recently. And to be able to come closer to Odessa, you still need to cross at least one more major river, which is currently not feasible. Two days ago, there were a bunch of Russian warships attacking the Odessa region, and it looks like they were testing coastal defense with zero success. As you can see, the whole military situation is on Ukrainian side. Russian troops are in disarray, depressed, lack of food and water according to many intercept conversations. Normal soldiers and even commandments don't use any encrypted channels, and the whole world can listen to them. Now let's talk about how this war can be ended. And I will be extremely honest, there are lots of different ways the situation can go, and I'm not a gypsy fortune teller to predict anything. The situation can be changed in one day, and war can be over if there is a coup in Russia or someone assassinate Putin. Assassination of Putin is quite unlikely because he's alone in a bunker somewhere in Yekaterinburg and no one is allowed to come close to him. But coup is 
quite possible. 100% of Russian business is against war. Many government officials around Putin understand that they must stop the war because the original plan failed and now, even if some part of Ukraine will be annexed, there will be no way to maintain its unruly population. Basically, it's 100% Putin's war right now. And if he stops it without reaching declared goals, it will be a political suicide for him. The good thing is that current Russian propaganda on TV says that military operation is going according to the plan, there is no war, the operation is about liberation of Donbas and Russia has no plan of capturing the rest of Ukraine. Nobody talks about cruel bombardments of Kyiv and Kharkiv and attempts to capture the cities, meaning that Putin can stop the war and easily declare victory on TV. It's very easy to convince the stupid part of the population that there are no more Nazis in Ukraine because they were known at the beginning. <laughs> if the war continues, the current propaganda might suffer a lot. Regular people are starting to understand that the war is real mainly due to the large number of killed or captured Russian soldiers. According to the Ukrainian military, almost 14,000 of Russian soldiers were killed. Western intelligence gave us 5,000. Both numbers are extremely high and contradict the official Russian number of 500. The rumors about killed sons are quickly spreading within a city or a village and brainwashed citizenry starts to question the official narrative and look for an alternative information and quickly finds out that there is a full-scale war and Russian soldiers used as a cannon fodder. Two days ago, on the main Russian TV channel, a former editor made a live statement against the war, saying that TV is spreading propaganda and lies. I'm not sure whether it was done with a silent acceptance of the channel or not, because it seems like the official management of the channel is secretly against the war, but it opens a new page in public discussions. Another big problem is discontent which can come from the army by itself. The Ukrainian side also claimed the destruction of 1200 armored vehicles, 600 transportation vehicles, 319 tanks, 77 warplanes and 90 helicopters. Well, you might be skeptical about this data, but there is no evidence that the Ukrainian side were intentionally increasing the losses. And there is an enormous photo and video evidence of these destructions pretty much every day. There are at least four Russian generals killed and confirmed by independent sources. It's not a joke. The food and water supply for Russian soldiers is chaotic and their original expectations was that there will be no real war, but basically a military parade and happy locals will be saluting them. If the war goes like this for another week or two, some part of the army can basically sabotage the whole thing and Putin will be forced to end that nonsense. Another thing is that spring is coming. Snow is melting and Ukraine is becoming extremely muddy. Russian tanks can't really move in that environment, meaning that they have to wait for a month or even more for any potential land offense in the north. Another powerful thing is sanctions. Many people were skeptical about them initially, but now we see that these are not sanctions, but a total economic war. The West doesn't want to sacrifice the lives of their citizens, but they are ready to do this in the economy, which is a great alternative to fight evil. The most surprising and effective sanctions are not one coming from the government, but from the private companies. Every company like McDonald's and IKEA left Russia. Tens of thousands of people lost their job. All the commercial chains were distorted. People are fighting for the sugar in the supermarkets right now. Basically, every Russian citizen feels that there is something wrong with the economy and it's just the beginning. Russia is more sanctioned than North Korea right now. Yesterday, the Russian government was very close to default, but they managed to avoid it this time and pay the debt. But it's a question of month or two. When that happens, other countries won't give any loans to Russia, meaning that Russia will be sanctioned worldwide and hyperinflation of ruble can reach 300%, killing all savings of regular people. Russia doesn't have food security and depends on exports a lot. It's very likely that in one or two months there will be a shortage of necessary food items. All this can make regular people finally to protest, increasing the chances of Putin to leave. Finally, war is extremely expensive and the supplies are running out. Russia asked China for dry food packages to support their army and more weapons, which is mind-blowing. We should have no illusion that China was aware of that Russian operation at the beginning 
and fully supported it as one of the power who wants to change the Western domination of the world. Basically, China wanted to use Russia as an icebreaker to see how the West reacts, assuming that weak Biden, Schultz and Macron didn't do much for Ukraine. There was even a friendship document signed between Russia and China on February 4, 2022, explicitly condemning NATO and asking for a new world order. The plan was probably that Russia annex Ukraine and China, Taiwan, and the West would keep silent. Russia failed the operation badly and the West introduced unthinkable sanctions. China is smart enough to understand that no additional supply can win the war in Ukraine, and its own economy is number one priority. So they only support Russia by giving them a bag of rice. And in case of weak and sanctioned Russia, China can get a cheap oil, which is even better than Taiwan. Alternatively, China can play a very dirty game and create a separatist republic in the Russian Far East. There were lots of rumors of that in the past. China would actually benefit from land expansion and manage to colonize these nearly empty lands very well. Now, contrary to losing Russia, Ukraine is getting an infinite amount of weapons from the West. There was a bad story with Polish MiG-29 planes who were supposed to be transferred to Ukraine, but apparently Putin said that if they do that, it will be a NATO's participation in the war and Biden vetoed the jets transfer. These planes are useful for Ukraine, but not really decisive at that moment. The current Ukrainian jets are not 100% in use. What is really needed is to close Ukrainian sky against missiles and long-range artilleries, which destroys the city. And NATO is not ready to do that, and it's understandable, and it won't happen at this point, but yesterday Biden announced an enormous 1 billion delivery of weapons, largely including the anti-missile systems, primarily old Soviet C-300, which does the job well, and Ukrainian army knows how to operate them. In addition, yesterday the UK confirmed the transfer of Star Streak air defense systems, which is another big thing to protect the sky. Finally, there is also a ceasefire negotiation process that recently became more realistic and Russians' demand got more reasonable. The draft of the proposal is the following. Complete ceasefire and Russian troops removal from Ukraine, excluding Crimea and Donbas. Ukraine must not join NATO. Ukraine must not allow any international military bases. Instead, the security will be guaranteed by US, UK and Turkey. The size of Ukrainian army must be limited. There will be a security exemption from Crimea and Donbas, which formerly are not going to be recognized as a part of Russia, but Ukraine won't be allowed to reclaim this land's military. This looks quite sane to me, but lots of details are still missing. And knowing Putin, it can take a while to make this agreement to be signed, because Putin really likes frozen conflicts and he really wants Ukraine to suffer as long as possible. But I feel cautiously optimistic. The biggest next question is reparation to Ukraine. Currently, it's at least $500 billion. And I think it can be a unique opportunity for private companies like IKEA and McDonald's, which can return to Russia under the condition of introducing a reparation tax of 10% and giving it back to Ukraine. Since most of these companies have little competition in Russia, this can actually work. And it will be a first case of privately organized reparation enforcement. Let's see how the situation develops, but Ukraine gonna win no matter what. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe and see you next time. Bye.